feel better about yourself when you, at the end of that workout because you you got past it. Very few things in life challenge you like this, right? You know, you at work you may get scolded, or at school you may get a bad grade. Here you get you get beat up, you get pounced on, right? So that's it's this feedback loop that's instant, and you know some people just can't get used to that. Right, and so it takes a lot mentally to get to the next level in the sport and to get comfortable. And it's it's more mental than physical in, in many ways. And and kind of to your point, it does seem like the gender gap in MMA is closing a lot faster than in other sports, right? In terms of popularity, like Ronda Rousey, I mean, it's people becoming household names that you know in other sports, you know, we haven't kind of bridged that gap yet. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I never thought about that. Right, you don't have. Um, Outside of soccer um, and maybe even basketball, um, you know, there's no women's football league. There's no, and even in boxing, like the women's boxing doesn't get anywhere near the visibility that men's boxing gets. So MMA, um, so that's something I haven't thought about a lot, but um, you do see that very often that you're going to see more and more women fighters coming up to the ranks. Like women's MMA, MMA is still in its infancy, right? Um, the whole Ronda Rousey phenomenon is, you know, less than is what four or five years old. Um, 10 years ago, there were no uh, women in the UFC. And actually, the owner of the UFC, um, one of the owners, his name was Dana White, he was the CEO as well, um, he, he just said, I'm not going to have any women in the UFC, and that's the stance. And, and you know, people just didn't raise an eyebrow when he said that. And then you fast forward, you know, five or six years, you know, some of the, the women are leading, you know, the main events of these cards and are doing, you know, in terms of business, the pay-per-views are, you know, nearly as big as the men's fights. Um, so, so it's, you know, kind of belies like a, a cultural shift, right, rather than an accessibility shift. Oh, absolutely. It's just, the culture just kind of turned, you know. And it's, uh, they're selling a story. Like, uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman or whatever. It's the, it's a story behind the fight, and people want to see good storylines. Right, right. right. Um, and very strong people <laughs> compete. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you have to be the, – the minimum bar is you need good fighters, right? Mm-hmm. And then a good, a good fighters is not enough to make a good fight that people want to see. Mm-hmm. Right, you need you need the you need the villain, and like Conor McGregor's been the villain for the UFC um, for the last couple of years, and now you know he's he's just blown up, and he's I don't know that last fight he made what fifty, sixty, seventy million dollars against mm-hmm. Mayweather mm-hmm. to do a boxing match, like right, that, that right. kind of money was unheard of ten years ago. You know, right. people are still fighting for twenty thousand dollars after your manager takes a cut after your your coaching staff takes a cut like you're left with nothing and if you get if you're injured i mean it's a tough life right that's also an interesting thing right there's a lot of um you know it's one of those sports if you don't make it to the highest level in other sports you're kind of left physically intact right whereas you know i i imagine a lot of people that you know want to make it on the ufc card um you know they dedicate their whole lives to this and then you know there's a lot of physical repercussions and consequences for, you know, uh, sparring and training every day for the past, you know, 10 years. Is there, do you, what's the conversation inside the sport with regards to uh, CTE and, and kind of the, the increasing evidence we have about, you know, the dangers of, of shots to the head? Or... Yeah. So you, you've seen um, the bigger camps um, in the country take it seriously, right? Because it's, you hear the conversation mostly about football. Mm-hmm. Um, you're starting to hear it about soccer. You're just like, you know, and it's not worth it. I have kids and I wouldn't let them play football, right, because right. of the CTE. And you see that, you know, 20, you know, a decade ago when people were training, they were training 100%. Even in practice, they were going all out and sparring. And he, I, I also remember when I used to spar a lot is after a sparring practice, the rest of the day was gone. Like I knew mm-hmm. I was going to have a headache and I was going to go home and just sleep it off. And but you didn't know better. You didn't worry about CT. You're just like you know you had a headache from boxing. Right. You brush it off. You just brush it off. Mm-hmm. And so you know that happened after you know a few years of that. You're like, man, that just can't be right. There's got to be something. Even before people were talking about CTE, you're like, mm-hmm. I should be a little bit more careful because something isn't quite right. I knew it wasn't right, but you couldn't put up. You you couldn't. You didn't identify what it what caused that. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you see people are uh, much safer the way they spar. They don't go as hard. Uh, they limit the number of active sparring sessions and rounds they do. They're much more strategic about that, saving some of the harder rounds just before a fight. Because you, you have to spar in order, to, you know, the only way to get good at fighting is to fight. And going, you know, 50% isn't going to get you ready for a fight. 
But limiting, you know, you also don't need 100 rounds of hard sparring against guys that are 30 pounds bigger than you. And so, you know, there are cases now. Um, Gary Goodrich was a very uh, popular fighter um, 10 or 15 years ago. He fought in a show called Pride in Japan. And Pride was like part UFC, part WWE. And, uh, you know, they had one event uh, around New Year's of 2000, 2001, where they drew um, a stadium that had over 100, 150,000 people watching a fight. And they would have a giant 400-pound guy, 7'4", fighting a 140-pound Japanese guy. Like, it was just, it was more theatric, but it was a real mm-hmm. fight. And, but, and everybody watched it. And you could only, here in the U.S., you only got it if you stayed up, like, really late because it was coming out of Japan. Um, and so there's a fighter, Gary Goodridge, he's from Canada, and he fought in a couple of UFCs. He's a super tough guy, former arm wrestler, 260 pounds, just built like a tank. And he would fight anyone, anywhere, and uh, mostly a striker. But he was getting knocked out, you know, three or four times a month at some point because they put him against the highest level guy. J- the Japanese loved him because he lived by the sword, he died by the sword. And, you know, he's either going to knock someone out or he's going to get knocked out, but he always put up a good fight. They loved him. And so he was just... One point in his career, he's getting knocked out so many times, and then now if you see him, he's—I mean, it's a—it's—it's it's tragic, right? Like he's had—he has a severe, well, you can't diagnose CT, but severe brain damage. Like when he talks, there's an impediment; you can't understand what he's saying. A lot of words, um, and hopefully, he—you know—I don't know how much better he can get, and I haven't seen him in a couple of years. But, um, and I've met other fighters through the years. I've had an opportunity to be in somebody's corner in the UFC a few times. And through that, I met a bunch of fighters, and you know, some of them are they stopped fighting because they've, you know, their um, some of the brain exams come back, and they're noticing patterns that shouldn't be there. They haven't been diagnosed with anything yet, but it's concerning enough where they stopped. Right, and I mean, I guess it's just you know different calculus for each individual. You know, you have some people, <clears throat> you know, to counter that, you have high profile players that have come out and said, you know, they don't really care. Like this is what they want to do. They want to play football, and they'll they'll die doing it. And I feel like that. It's almost inherent in in MMA if you want to make it to to a certain yeah. level. Is that something you kind of like yeah. watch out for, or you know how does I how does kind of like the, the MMA circuit it's deal true, with? Right? Yeah, it's 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 calculus. You look at you know what's the probability of you making millions of dollars, mm-hmm. and what's the risk associated with that, um, and then you take you know some people are comfortable with that risk, and some people aren't. Right. Right. And do you have other uh, options in life to do other things that you might love? Right. If I had a, if I had a, I have two daughters, but if I had a son, would I want him to go into mixed martial arts? Absolutely not. Hmm. Right? Do I want him to train martial arts? For sure. Right. Do I want him to fight? No. The more you train, the more you realize that you probably don't want to fight um, because of the inherent dangers of it. Um, Just training is, is and, and, gives and, you a taste. And martial, training martial arts is different than the sport of mixed martial arts, right? Training martial arts can be done safely and it can be done where you learn at the very highest level and you learn fighting like everybody else stepping into a ring and actually competing is a quite it's a different thing it's a different beast um and it's a lot more dangerous um and i don't know if the 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 rewards are there yet for most of the people like there's probably fewer than 10 guys that make millions fighting right right the the most you know if you're an undercard guy even at the ufc which is the nfl of fighting you're making 2,000 to fight and 2,000 to win. Maybe now it's like 4,000 sh- to show and 4,000 to win for 8,000 really? bucks after taxes and paying everyone. You fall for $1,000. <laughs> like, right. You got to be kind of crazy to, you know, it's not about the money for a lot of these guys. Right, right. right. And it's about, you know, there's, there's, there's a, you have to respect someone who's willing to sacrifice a lot to achieve what they really want. And they're sacrificing a lot, right? They could be doing other things. They could be making money, having families going out there. They've given up a lot to be in the ring in terms of training and, you know, physically, um, their health. Everything's at risk there. And, um, you know, it's that whole samurai spirit that some some people have that, you know, they want to be champion. And it's not about the $2,000 or, or the $1 million. They want to be the number one fighter that in the guy. world. Yeah, right. Do you, do you foresee any, you know, in the future, as, you know, more scientific research comes out and stuff, with the government stepping in and maybe uh, enforcing some certain rules on, on UFC or just other, you know? Yeah. So if you, probably, I think it was a decade ago where John McCain stepped in. They tried to ban the UFC. Like, UFC was on its last legs in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? There's 
pay-per-views were dismal. I think forty or 50,000 people were buying it. Not enough to make it interesting. They were losing money at every show. Um, John McCain took an interest, said this is, you know, this is human cockfighting. This can't be legal. Um, a lot of the fights went underground at that point. Um, it was essentially dead in the water. And, you know, Dana White was the guy who said, you know, there's something here. We just need to create some rules around the sport. We need some more regulations. We need to professionalize it. He talked um, to a couple of his friends who happened to be very wealthy, the Fertitta brothers, and they bought the UFC. And I think they paid, it was like two or three million bucks, something just like absolutely nothing. And, you know, it took them a few years to turn it around. And I think ultimately they had to invest 20 or 30 million bucks. Mm -hmm. But they just sold it. Uh, was it last year or two years ago for $4.2 billion? Like, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty there, good return yeah. on investment for $2 million. But, you know, he they implemented certain standards that professionalized the sport, right? Mm -hmm. And it's still a brand new sport. Like, you know, where was football or baseball after 25 years? Right. Right. Um, and then new rules will come, and the government will probably intervene at some point. The, all it takes is one death in the ring or in the cage. Right, right. right. And it's happened. Like, people have died in the cage. And they've had, you know, they probably had just 10 people. Here just not here. Just not in the UFC. On pay-per-view, right. right. In right. amateur levels, people die. Yeah. In you don't hear about boxing, but boxing every year suffers five to ten deaths internationally. You know, UFC probably has one to two just because mm -hmm. there aren't as many fights. Um, you know, there's been 10 or 15 deaths, um, but none on pay-per-view. And as right. soon as that happens, there's going to be an uproar and someone's going to step in. Right. It's inevitable. I mean, even – I mean, it doesn't have to be a death, right? Just I, I feel like anything on pay-per-view, same thing with football, right? One hit that, you know – God forbid, but leave somebody, you know, paralyzed or something. Yeah, like it's, I, so it's on I, Monday Night Football on live TV, right? I think that's... Yeah, I trained... Um, we don't have any... Um, we had a couple professional... So we had two guys that fought in the UFC at the gym. And now they're trainers, a little bit older. Um, but we have a bunch of amateurs. And so there's probably, you know, there's 10 or 15 people that train to, to fight. And they want to be professional at some point. And so we go to cards all over the Midwest to, to compete. Um, in 2013-14, I went to a show out in Peoria. And so uh, one of my friends was on the car, and I was like, oh, you know, it's a Saturday night, you have a couple beers, and you want some fights. And, and so we're literally cage side, and we're watching this fight, and neither guy probably should have been... I take that back. They needed more coaching before they got into the ring. And um, one guy jumped on the other guy's back, so that's a normal position in the fight. The guy stood up, and the guy's hanging on his back trying to choke him. The guy who was standing, he tried to roll out of the – to escape. So basically he wanted to flip and he wanted to not land on his head but land on his opponent's head to get him off. Fortunately, it didn't happen like that. He spiked himself on the head and his body went limp instantly. Um, he didn't move. I was like – I almost lost – like I was just sickening to hear the sound because you knew it was over. You knew he was his, – his opponent knew something happened because he was just laying – limp on the mat um, I couldn't watch anymore so I had to leave and then uh, a week later you know I was just like I really had to, I didn't stop thinking about it I was like I had to find out what happens to this kid and so they had a I called the reporter in the Tribune I said this is what happened at an event uh, can you investigate and the guy's like yeah so he, he, he looks into it and he writes a story about it and the kid he had uh, he's a super nice kid um he was a breadwinner in his family. He had like four or five brothers and sisters, and it was just him and his mom. And uh, he never walked again. And this is, I so I, I connect. I found him on online, and I reached out to him a couple years later. Um, and I bring him to the gym occasionally, but he's in a wheelchair, and he's probably going to be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. Um, last it was it last year, maybe even two years back. Um, one of my friends works for the UFC, and I said, "Hey, can we bring this guy to the fights?" So he called Dana White up, and Dana White, you know. Gave him backstage passes, took him, you know, they brought him right in. They gave him the VIP treatment. Um, and, you know, you asked him, like, would you, do you regret doing this? He still says no. That's, yeah. Isn't it crazy? I, mean, that's, I feel like that's kind of the attitude you have to have, yeah. right, to do a lot of sports and a lot of, not even sports, you know, any, any endeavor that you want to be really good at, right? But not all of them have the consequences that. Right. That. And that, that's the that worst, you know, suffered. the only thing worse is death at that point, right? right? Imagine, like, you know, one day you could walk, the next day you're right. completely paralyzed. It's completely life-changing. Yeah. Life yeah. But, you know, the crazy thing is he hasn't given up. Like, he's hungry. He has ideas for business ventures. He's constantly working. You know, he's hustling to make it. Um, and he's just, like, 
he's like, you know, this stuff happens and he's accepted it, but he ha- hasn't given up. And, you know, he that spirit is what would have made him a great fighter if he had just kind of a little more training, had a little more, a little better coaching at that point. This should never have happened. Like, he probably shouldn't have been in a ring at that point. In the- 